What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two, or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak. Let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. What is liturgy? Well, in, in, in the basic format, liturgy is basically just means order, order of service. Um, if you've ever been to an Anglican service, and their order of service and the way they did things was not identical to the way we did things. The big points were there, but there is some difference, and it was probably a little more structured, meaning more things built in automatically each week. But everyone, even those who say, we don't have any order, there's some kind of order, and usually it's some kind of default order, you know, even if it's bulletins, you know, or, or announcements and all these different things. And so the question is, what is happening in your service, in your big gatherings, your corporate formal gatherings, what are you doing? That's your liturgy. Higher liturgy usually involves more prescribed elements, lower liturgy usually less. And when you use the word liturgical, it usually refers to those built-in elements, your order. Well, this passage is highly interesting because guess what it does? It gives us a snapshot into the liturgy of early Christian worship. Now, the Corinthians aren't a good example. Their liturgy was chaos. We'll see here in a second. And Paul is saying, not that way, more like this way. So that's why I've called this liturgy for dummies. There's three sections I'm going to say that I broken down these 14 verses into. The first one is about order in our gatherings. So those are the verses I just read, which we're going to discuss in a minute. That's when you get together corporately, sort of formal, sort of official. Usually weekly Christians have done those. Order in our relationships. Now this relates to the first one, but it's not identical. Verses 33 through 38. And then Paul ends by saying order in all things. Verses 39 through 40. Now, why? Why? Why order? Is it order for the sake of, of order? Is Paul OCD and stuck it in here? And that's all, what, what's, the order is for building up. This order is talked about in 1 Corinthians 14. Every time we get to a verse, even if you don't know fully exactly right when you read it, what's going on, realize this order is for building up. Others, meaning the order is in, instilled in here because of love. And guess what? That's not a stretch, is it? Because what was right before 1 Corinthians 14? 1 Corinthians 13. This beautiful, prosaic expose on what is love. And the big thing love is, is outward looking, just like the triune God. So let's look at these verses one by one, sometimes two by two. And let's see what we can discern this morning. You guys see down in your Bibles, if you're able to look, please follow along in the text. At verse 26 there. So Paul is like, hey, what are you guys doing? Uh, it's, it's chaos in your gatherings. Everyone comes together. They want to contribute. But then they're kind of like doing it all at once. Everyone's just jumping on the mic. It's like an open mic where there's three people on the open mic. And he's saying, that's not the way to do it. Everything needs to be done for building up, which then he's going to proceed to explain to them what that would look like. Do you guys see that in verse 26? Well, there's some takeaways just from that one verse that this section begins in as we talk about order for building up. Firstly, the church is filled with diverse gifts. See, those aren't all the same, are they? Him, 
lesson, revelation, tongue, interpretation, diverse gifts. Everyone's not supposed to be up here. Everyone's not supposed to be in a child's classroom teaching. Everyone's not supposed to be running sound, but someone is supposed to be running sound. The question is, which diverse gift has God given you? What are you doing with it to serve, to be outward? What are you doing with it? Because you've got one of these diverse gifts, maybe even quite a few of these diverse gifts. But that's a good thing we can take away from this. Another thing is that the Holy Spirit gives these gifts. Why though? For others. Do you see, after all these gifts are listed, it says, let all things be done for building up. The gifts you've been given, and I would even say the gifts that you've, you've seen blossom since you've become a Christian, the gifts that you've seen blossom if you've tried different ministries, those are for others. You've been given those for others. The Holy Spirit sovereignly decides who he gives what, and his reason is the same reason he, that Jesus gave for others. And I would say another takeaway is that we should pray for these gifts. Very end of this, when we get down to verse 40, you're going to see that Paul will say, earnestly desire. Earnestly desire. So if you say, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't have it. Pray for these gifts. Pray that you would have more of these gifts. Pray that you won't be scared to use these gifts. Pray that you'll find a way to use them. And it's not some magical formula. You don't need to sit down. You don't need to take a test. The, basically thing, the basic thing is, if there's an opening and you think you can do it, try it, and you'll see. You don't know all. You'll find out. God will show you. You're gifted in this area. The best way is to try it. And that's, that's sort of the best hands-on way. Instead of all of this test-taking and, and deliberating, if you think you might be gifted in an area, talk to people that are in that area, try it. But pray for these gifts, church. And you know, the Corinthians are easy to make fun of, right? They sound like wild people, and they sort of were. But at least they wanted to contribute. You know, they, were, they didn't just want to sit there. The one's like, I got a new hymn. I got a new lesson. I got a new, I mean, at least they wanted to contribute. Now their motivations may have sometimes been, you know, more related to American Idol, but at least they wanted to contribute. When you come in these gathered meetings, is that an interest of yours to contribute? If not, the Corinthians are doing better than you. Yeah, they're chaotic, and maybe you're not, but at least they wanted to contribute. Contribute. Pray that you can. The Lord will show you. Order in our gatherings, specifically in the area of tongues. Now, you're going to see when we get into this passage, it's got everything controversial it could. It's got prophecy. It's got tongues. It's got the place of men and women in church leadership. All right here in these verses that I've been given this morning. Well, let's start with tongues, and we're not going to solve every issue, but we can say some things that are from this text. So look down again, if you could, please, verses 27 and 28 in your Bibles in 1 Corinthians 14, and Paul gives some instructions. Let's look at these. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or three, at mo two or at most three, each in turn, let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church, speak themselves unto God. This is sort of a, a flow chart, a decision tree in a way. If this, then that. Yes, no. Now, I was working on a whole crazy flow chart, and I realized there'd be no way people could see it. It wasn't going to be helpful. So instead, we did the good old checklist. So look up there if you could for a second. See on the tongue side. If there have been less than two or three that have already done it in that gathering, then you can proceed. If there's only one person speaking, so it's each in turn, it's not everybody at once. What would be the point of that? Paul says they'll think you're crazy and no one understands it. If there's no one speaking or there's only one person, you're the one doing it, you can proceed. Lastly, if there's been an interpretation. So if the first person goes and there's no interpretation of the tongues in this context, then there's no more tongues at service. If there is, then it's possible to proceed to the next. But it's going to stop two, three. But what about the other side, the silent side? This is the side where don't do tongues in your worship service if there's been more than three. If you're the fourth person, 
No tongues for you that day, Paul is saying. Because what could happen is you could have these services and the whole time would be people speaking in tongues. No one knows what's going on. The tongue talkers are having a lot of fun. No one else is having any fun. And it's chaos because they like to go all at once. Bad news, Paul says. One at a time. So if there's more than one, hold your horses. Not now. If there has been no interpretation, silence. If any of those parameters are met, silence. If all three of the others are met, then there can be tongues. Now, if you read this, you notice Paul says, let there. It's kind of like a concessive way that Paul is putting it, I would say. He says prophecy are superior to tongues. And he also says that there's um, these, these fences, these walls that need to be built around it. Now, there's lots of debate right now in 2014 about tongues and all that. I understand that. We allow different interpretations and understandings. Whatever your view is, though, if it's something that is part of your worship life now, wherever you are, it needs to meet these parameters. If not, why not? Now, I actually grew up Pentecostal charismatic. I saw a lot of good stuff, knew a lot of good people, but I also saw lots of services where everyone is speaking in tongues all at once a lot. I saw one time where I was in a, in a context where someone went, they had tongues, someone gave an interpretation, then someone else went, they had tongues, and there was no interpretation, and the next person was going to go, and this is the only time I'd ever seen this in my life, but I so appreciated it. The guy in charge, Brother Farmer, was his name, he used to go, fuck him! Brother Farmer, he's a big old guy. Anyway, so uh, props, Brother Farmer. Brother Farmer says, oh, that's enough. There's no interpretation. No one else is going. That was the one time, and I was like, whoa, he did it. That was 1 Corinthians 14. That was nice to see. So, whatever our thoughts are, we see this is in place. But before you get bogged down, because I'm not going to solve your tongues issue right now, but here's what I'm going to say. The order that Paul is giving for this is still for the same big picture reason, which is for others. The order is still all about love. That's the reason for it. So every gift must be exercised with love. So let's look at some of the takeaways from that. I would say that tugs are regulated, not mandated from this passage. It's not a command that you must have tongues in every service, is it? But they are regulated, not required even in that context, I don't believe. Whatever communication there is must be intelligible. That's why an interpretation is absolutely necessary. Do you see? Intelligible communication is part of loving and caring about others. That's why if, if, if in this context we got up here and did a bunch of academic jargon, that wouldn't be loving towards the congregation because... Half the people would say, I don't know anything that was said this morning. Must be intelligible. And look at this. Different gifts complement each other. But what is this? Someone is getting a revelation to speak in tongues. But they can't do it by themselves, can they? Because someone else needs to give an interpretation. The point of that, before you get, again, bogged down in tongues, is that the gifts, whatever they are, they complement each other. They go together. They work hand in glove. That's important. Whatever your gift is, someone else needs it and you need someone else. It's symbiotic. They're complementary. All the gifts are and including tongues. Look down there in the next verses, 29 through 32. 29 through 32, please. Let two or three prophets speak. Let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent, for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirit prophets are subject to prophets. Now again, what is prophecy? There's different definitions for how people give it in these contexts. Carson, for example, says spirit-prompted utterance. Grudem says it's reporting something that God brings to mind, speaking truth, especially in a heart-penetrating way. So whatever your understanding of prophecy is, and I encourage you to study the topic, again, 
It's ordered. It's regulated. Now let's talk a little bit about that order, that regulation. Firstly, we must evaluate what is said. You guys see that? It says that there, and where did my verse go? It says, uh, let the others weigh what is said there in 29. So who are the others? Some people say it's the other leaders or other prophets. Some people say that it's the whole congregation. Whoever it is, you can see that there's part of the way prophecy would function is someone is evaluating. The Greek word there means to evaluate by paying careful attention, to weigh carefully, even to pass judgment on, to deliberate, to sort, to sift. That's what that word evaluate there means. That discrimination, in a sense, of what's what. That is a requirement. You guys remember in the book of Acts, where Luke, the author, says that Paul was going from town to town. He goes to Thessalonica, then he goes to Berea and says, now the Jews at Berea were more fair-minded than the ones at Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily to see if the things that Paul said matched, if they were so, if they lined up. Isn't that beautiful? What about 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? It says this in 19, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good. It seems there's a weighing there of speech that Paul is instructing the churches to do. There's an evaluation. If your theology is, because my pastor said so, it's anemic. Now, I'm not saying you're not allowed to quote your pastors. That's all legit. But if it stops there, if all you say is my pastor said, it's anemic. You're not weighing. Where's your evaluation? Where's your yardstick? It's the scripture. Can you handle it? Do you do that? That's what mature believers are supposed to do. That's part of the requirement of being a Christian, of listening to teaching, is to evaluate. Now, this is, of course, an application because I'm saying that we should weigh all speech. In this specific context, it seems to be weighing, evaluating prophecy, but I think that we can see the application holds for us today. We must weigh and evaluate what is said. Another takeaway is that order, the structure, this liturgy that Paul is saying this needs to be part of your service, it aids or it facilitates learning and encouragement. You guys see the end there, verse 32? So that all may learn and all may be encouraged. Again, the point of spirit-prompted utterance is not so everyone can go, whoa, that dude has got mad gift of gab. Which, by the way, that's what the Corinthians love to do. They love to hear, like, dude tell funny stories. They were all about that. That's not the point. It's not to entertain you. Where's the joke set in the sermon, right? It's not that. It's so that you may learn and be encouraged. But that it's not happening if you don't understand what's going on, if everyone's speaking at once, if no one's weighing what is said. And watch this. This last line is interesting. Spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. I would say the big picture from that is gifts must be exercised with love. Now, let me explain. What does that mean, the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets? In the ancient world, they had an understanding of prophecy that they called it. But it, generally speaking, was uncontrolled, frenzied, ecstatic utterances. You know, your eyes kind of, you know, that kind of stereotype picture. That was plentiful in the ancient world within their religious context. And political leaders even would talk to some of these people that supposedly some god or deity would speak through and take them over kind of thing. That's not the way the Bible ever pictures prophecy. Not in the Old Testament, not here. It's not some crazy thing where you're, you're not there and you're checked out. The spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. Meaning, if Paul says, when you're speaking and someone else wants to go, because he says this, you sit down and be quiet, that must mean that you're able to still exercise self-control over this gift. And you'll stop talking because you exercise your gift out of love. My point is, whatever the gift is, is to be exercised with love and self-control as part of it. 
Well, I just had to say something. And, you know, misuse of the gifts. Exercise with love, with care, with caution. I think those are good takeaways, whatever our understanding is. And like I said, I'm not here to solve everything. I want us to see the big picture takeaway, and we could talk about those other things. We're not scared to discuss those. We want to discuss what are tongues, what are prophecy. But this sermon, the big focus is order in order to build up. Let's make sure we leave with that. Now, again, why? This order in our gatherings has to actually do with the kind of picture we're painting of who God is. Who is God? Verse 33a tells us, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. This God could have created everything all at once. Have you ever thought about that? Creation days? Why not just God in the beginning created, bam, done? There's a structure with the narrative in Genesis. He's a God of order. He's dividing up tribes. He's giving them banners. He's giving leaders. There's a structure. Now, that's not, this is not an excuse, again, for stoicism. That's not the point. But the point is, God, why does he want order? Well, first of all, it reflects his very nature, his very character. He is logically consistent with himself. He's ordered. His, his emotions aren't out of control. He doesn't think untrue thoughts. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit relate to each other in a perfectly ordered way. They have a relationship that's structured and designed and built God's very nature in order to facilitate love between the three persons of the Trinity. God himself is ordered. He's of peace. Things are set right in his kingdom. His people must show this. In every way, when we meet together, in the way we relate to each other, in every way, we reflect his character. Otherwise, people say, I don't know about this Christian God, but dude's like all over the place. He must be scatterbrained because look at his people. Check him out. We're supposed to reflect who he is by what we do. And our, stru- our services should try to be structured in that way because he is a God of order. Now, as you guys look down, that's as far as I read. But we're going to continue on, and I see somewhat of a switching of major themes. There's still order there, and it still relates to the gatherings, but it's order in relationships. This next, these next verses I'm going to read, it's order in relationships. And you'll see those, I think, when we get there. Now, so far, let's look at where we've gone. We've had tongues discussed. We've had interpretation of tongues. We've had prophecy and we had evaluation of prophecy. Do you actually see that? Tongues, interpretation, prophecy, evaluation. It seems as if what is being discussed here is the evaluation of the prophecy. That's what I think the context is, the next verses I'm going to read. Let me read these, and then let me explain these. Verse 33, starting in verse B. As in all the churches of the saints... The women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, what do we do with those? A first blush reading, overly simplistic, which doesn't take any contextual factors into play, I think actually would lead us to a contradiction. What do I mean by that? You don't have to, but you can flip back to 1 Corinthians 11 because 1 Corinthians 11 comes before, right, 1 Corinthians 14. Now, the discussion in 1 Corinthians 11 is some interesting cultural things related to men and women's roles and what's going on in the service. But if you look there, there's two verses that let us know, verse 5 specifically and verse 13, that women were praying and prophesying in their public gatherings. And I do think it's public gatherings because right after he starts talking about communion. So the context clearly seems to be the public formal gatherings there. So here's the question. If they can pray and prophesy, what do you mean be silent? That's why we have to say he has a qualified silence. Now, the word silence sounds harsh to our ears at first, doesn't it? But Paul's been using it all throughout, hasn't he? 
You guys remember who else should be silent? The tongue speaker that doesn't have the right condition satisfied for his tongue speaking. Remember that? And the prophet who doesn't have the right condition satisfied. It says in both of those, let them remain silent. Well, it's not an unqualified silence, is it? Because they're tongue speaking, interpreting, or prophesying. But there is some kind of silence appropriate for certain people, certain places, certain times. Well, let's talk about that. So we see there's context in which there are to be women who speak in this context of gathered public worship. But then clearly there's other contexts where they're not. What are those contexts? Again, they prayed, they prophesied, and they may even been part of the, the group of people who is, it says in the beginning, verse 26, bring all this stuff. I've got a hymn because it seems like clearly women were part of hymns and singing and corporate worship. So what is this silence? Well, if right before he's talking about prophecies and weighing and evaluating them, remember that was the discussion right before, why not think this is not a weird digression? This is still talking about the thing he was just talking about, the weighing and evaluation of prophecies. It makes contextual sense, the flow. Now, what's that all about? The weighing of prophecies, the discriminating of prophecies, the, the um, evaluation, all of that seems to be a teaching function in the church. It seems to be an authoritative function, that part of it. It seems to have to do with something the elders should do. It seems to have to do something that male headship should do. How do we know that? 1 Timothy 2.12 is another place where you see Paul speak about what are the proper role relationships within God's people in these formal gatherings. And he says that women are not to be part of the male eldership, the ultimate final teaching authority in the mixed multitude. Okay, now, let me try to qualify this a little bit more. Paul knows Aquila and Priscilla. You guys remember them? husband and wife team, who taught Apollos. The Bible says this, Acts 18. What's the context in which they together taught Apollos? It's not a formal gathering. It's not the public corporate gathering. It says they took him aside. So that was there. Titus 2 even actually commands women to teach. If you read Titus 2, you'll see that there's certain contexts in which Paul's saying, women, teach. But who are they to teach when? In the corporate gathering, this is to be done primarily by the elders. And if you look at the qualifications for elders in 1 Timothy and in Titus, elders seem to be something reserved for men. Now, this obviously lands us in one side of a theological controversy called complementarianism. These are the names that get attached to positions. Complementarianism says that men and women have certain roles, they're, they're equal in every way, but they're different. Egalitarianism is a position that says men and women now can do all the same things. Yeah, they're equal, but there's nothing that is reserved for one or the other. And now here's what you've got to do. If you say, I don't know about that, I can't give you every alternate explanation, but I can give you some. Some people say, well, where it says the women aren't permitted to speak, maybe they're being chatty because it says, if there is anything to desire to learn, let them ask their husband homes. Maybe they're just talking a lot during the service. Maybe that was the problem. I have a few questions. If that's your position, it doesn't say that. It, it says it's shameful. It says it's disgraceful. It doesn't say that they're being disruptive, does it? If you want to say it's they're disruptive, you've got to put it in there as a possible reason. It makes your interpretation probabilistic. It doesn't say that's a problem. And here's the thing. Do you think that only women would be disorderly? Certainly, some of the disorderliness would come from the men. Why then only the women? And the other thing is this. Paul's reason says they're not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. His reason is not because you're disrupting. His reason actually goes back to Scripture, as the law also says. See, he relates it to creation. What, where does the law say this? 
Paul, sometimes we use the word law as shorthand for Old Testament teaching, for Hebrew scriptures. Probably specifically he has in mind here, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 especially. Some people say Genesis 3, but remember, Genesis 3 is given in a fallen context. It's saying things aren't supposed to be like this, but they will be, where men and women will be basically at odds with each other. So the Genesis 3 one, I don't think he's referring to that because that's just God saying, now your relationships are going to be messed up. Genesis 1 and 2, though, do have a certain order and differentiation between men and women. That's what Paul seems to be referring to. Paul also uses this submission language in Ephesians 5, where he talks about the husband and the wife. And he uses an analogy, just like the bride, the church is submitted to Christ. So likewise is the wife to be submitted to husband. Now, all these things are not cool in the 21st century. We know that. We believe the Bible and we believe God is allowed, entitled to make decisions about his creation. And he has done so. And he tells us this. We don't want to say, let's get away from this. Let's be embarrassed about this. Let's say, look, here's my understanding of it. And I submit to God's instruction on this. We are different and we do have different things we're to do. I could spend the next 10 minutes saying all the bad ways this has been interpreted and that that's bad. Meaning I could say, this has happened and men being sinful have done this to women throughout the centuries and ages. And this is one of the ways that they've twisted, uh, you know, twisted the Bible and they've dominated and they've made excuses for all types of horrible things. That is true. But my sermon is not to talk about all the ways a, a verse can be twisted or wrongly interpreted. It's to try to tell you what I think it actually is saying. So if you're worried about why weren't there more qualifications this morning? Why didn't vocab say about all the bad things that have happened? We can talk about that, and that's true. And that's part of sinful men acting sinful towards their fellow humans who are totally equal in every way. But that's not the emphasis of this passage. The emphasis is God is a God of order. He wants his services ordered. He wants his people ordered. He has his creation already ordered. We recognize this. We can fight it all we want, but we recognize the truth of the order built into creation and say, I submit. So really, this issue ultimately is actually an issue of God's sovereignty. Do you recognize God's sovereignty over his creation? Do you recognize that he's made it? Do you recognize he's made it how he wants it? Do you recognize that he tells us what is what? We say we believe God is sovereign. If we do, we say, okay, I'll not just grumble and submit to these passages. This is all of us. This is male, female alike. Instead, I'll rejoice in God's sovereignty. He's made me this way. This is what he wants from me. I'm going to do it. Why? For others. For others. That's what order is supposed to be all about. Now, let me give you some takeaways that I'm going to reiterate a little bit from here that God created and designed both men and women to fulfill certain roles. We are not the same. Neither is better. And there's a perfect analogy with the Trinity. Jesus is the Son. The Son is not the Father. The Holy Spirit, fully God, co-equal, co-eternal, co-powerful, is not the Son. He's not the Father. There are true role distinctions within the triune Godhead, aren't there? We have to say that or else we're no longer Trinitarian. We're in some kind of crazy heresy like modalism or subordinationism, something like that. But they're none inferior. The son is not inferior. He's different. He's still God though. And he's willful in his acceptance of who he is as the son because of love for others. That's why he said, I take on flesh. I give my life to sinners who don't deserve. The son is the only one who did that. The father did not die on the cross for your sin. Obviously he planned it, but he did not take on flesh. The Holy Spirit empowers Jesus, but the Holy Spirit did not die on the cross for your sin. Jesus did. There is a difference in the role relationship, even among the triune God. But is anyone inferior? See, it's sort of a Western... I mean, it's easy to get into, to think 
if there's differentiation in the roles, it automatically implies inferiority in some way. This is not the case. Proper order, proper rulership don't imply inferiority on anyone. Why, why would they have to? It just means we're different. It means we walk in certain things. To walk in our God-given roles is orderly. And remember, this is about order. So you got to say, does it make sense in the context? To step outside is disorderly. This is how it flows in the narrative. And we learn best in an ordered community. Do you guys see there where he says, if they have any questions, let them ask? Meaning everyone is still part of this learning community and the best way to learn is in an ordered community. So if you think about the ministry of Jesus and in their culture, it was shameful to even be seen talking to a woman, but that's not a biblical thing, is it? John 4, Jesus is talking to a woman at the well. She's a Samaritan, so she wasn't even pure. She's some kind of adulterer slash prostitute, home record, don't know, but she's got four or five husbands up to this point. Talks to her, talks to her about theology, teaches her, speaks to her, doesn't talk down to her, talks to her as a creature made in God's image that she is. And she's the one who evangelizes that town. Jesus, Mary and Martha, you guys remember that? One, Mary, is like, wait, did I just get him confused? Yeah, I think it's Mary. I just got it confused in my head. I think Mary is doing this sort of more traditional. No, I think I had it backwards. Does anyone remember off the top of my head? Well, Mary and Martha are there. One of them is doing the more traditional role of getting the food ready. That's what she kind of thought she was supposed to do. The other one is sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning from the rabbi. One says, Jesus, tell her to come help me. What's she doing even? Like, we're supposed to be here. Jesus says, don't trouble her. She's picked the better portion. Do you see that? This is radical. So before, again, you would say, well, this 1 Corinthians 14 is just like maybe cultural. Like they were kind of like submitting to the culture of Greco-Roman. Paul says, no, it's because the law says. And when he talks about it in 1 Timothy 2, he says it's because creation. The reason given has to match your theology of why this is in here. And the p- solution that Paul gives should also match. Meaning if you want to say, it's just because the women were speaking and they weren't as educated. Some people say that in that time. Paul's answer shouldn't be, stop talking. It should be, well, go educate those folks. Then let them talk in that way during the service. It wasn't that, was it? See, it has to do with something different. Something we don't always like, but God's way is best. Now, I did not say everything I could say, Some of you are happy, some of you are mad, some of you are confused. Let's talk about it after. And uh, I pray that it's edifying ultimately that we get the big takeaways which are there before we move on. I pray we do. All right. Order in our relationships, verses 36 to 38. Paul, maybe even knowing that some of what he said so far is not going to go over well with the Corinthians. And I don't think this just applies to the verses about the proper role relationships between men and women. I think this 36 to 38 is about this whole section. He seems to be speaking to all of them now. And watch what he says. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones is it is reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Now, the Corinthians weren't in at various times to apostolic authority. They weren't even in to being governed by scripture sometimes. Paul is saying, look, you guys, you don't originate the word of God. You're not the only ones. This is part of all churches. Remember Paul speaks about, why do you think it's cool to go way over here outside when this is the lane, he's saying. He's saying, look, if you think you're prophet or spiritual, then you know what I'm writing to you is a command from the Lord. But if you don't recognize it, you're not recognized. That means if you don't recognize these instructions as valid, then you're invalidated yourself as at least a prophet or a spiritual person, perhaps even as a Christian. How can a Christian say, Yes, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I love the Lord with all my heart. Command of the Lord, not really into that one. You can't go there. That's not saying he's Lord. That's not 
That's not living out what you say about who you are and who he is. What are some takeaways from this? We're part of the universal church. We're going to say the Apostles' Creed here after communion. And part of it originally would say one holy apostolic Catholic church, I believe is the wording. Catholic is just with a lowercase c, it just means universal. That's what the word means. We usually say universal so as to avoid confusion. But there's a universal gathering of God's people, all places, all time, all space, all eras, all languages, all geographical, everything. We're part of that. That's a takeaway from that because you can see you're not doing this alone. It's not just you, Paul is saying. Consider what is orthodox. Consider what is true. Consider your brothers and sisters. Consider the other. Another takeaway, the Holy Spirit gives gifts and he gives the word of God for instruction. So yes, the Holy Spirit gives gifts, but then he tells us how to use them. So the same one who gave the gift, is not going to then tell you to misuse it or to have you use it in a way that contradicts what he said. That's why you can't say, well, I know the Bible says that, but personally, I feel this way, or I know the Bible says that, but God told me this, so here's what it really means. Is God a God of confusion? Is the Holy Spirit going to give you a gift, then say, now go use it in a way that's contrary to how I've told you to use it? No. That's why this is important for us. Christians must obey the Lord. We recognize these as commands from the Lord, and we realize that the learning and encouragement happens best in an ordered community, and so we gladly submit to these things. Now, when you take all this together, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, it's a whole section on gifts and how they're to be used. The big key is in love. The way that love is best expressed is in order so people can be properly edified, so they can be properly built up. And as we come to the end of this, we see the very last instruction here, verse 39 through 40. So my brothers, earnestly desire to prophecy. Do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. There's a balance here between freedom and structure. And every gift, whatever it is, is to be used for building up others. Just like the love that God has for us, it's others directed, so should our use of our gifts. So this directly relates to what Jesus has done on the cross. The way we use our gifts directly relates because we would use them in the same way that Jesus used what he had, if you want to put it that way. It's others facing so should the use of our gifts be. And so now as we come to take communion, we realize this body, this blood, it represents that Jesus has a love that is others facing. He's not required to do it, yet he did. How much more should his people utilize their gifts in a way that is others facing and others directed? Yes, we should study and find out some of the theological intricacies of this, but the big point is God, give me those gifts, please, and then enable me to use them in a way that is for others' benefit, not just my own. This is the theology of the cross. This is what Jesus has done.